our son is the best son in the world. The very normal, active boy did all the things that most boys like to do. I'm perfectly happy with the person I am and I've always been. Women started going missing. They seem to vanish without a trace. Young, pretty white females, dark haired. The bodies of more young women were found strangled or bludgeoned by this brutal killer. This guy came up to me, very good looking. He said, Hi, I'm Ted. Every day I get input, every day I ask questions. Uh, but the reason I went on my own is because I just felt it was time. I felt it was right. I wanted to get involved. I wanted to become a part of my defense because I am such a part of it. I mean, I, I obviously, I'm going to bear the consequences, so why not bear the responsibility of, uh, of seeking my own acquittal and uh, sustaining my own innocence? Ted, when you left Salt Lake, when you were extradited, you issued a statement saying you feel that everything will turn out all right, that you are innocent. Do you still feel that? That, yeah, more than ever. Uh, of course, uh, you can't help but become an advocate for yourself when you're so involved in the case. I mean, being a good defense attorney, and I'm not, again, I'm not pretending I'm an attorney, but, but being, putting yourself in a position of being your own counsel, you, it's that positive psychology. You're going to do it. You're going to do it because you're right. You're going to do it because the person you're representing is innocent. It just happens to be, in this case, I've got a lot of stake, and the person I'm representing is myself, and I'm working all the harder. Yeah, I feel good about it, and yes, I feel that I'm right, and yes, I'm go I feel I'm going to make it, no doubt in my mind. There's always one thing that amazed me, as you know, I covered your trial, and I was there every day. When you, uh, when the judge found you guilty of uh, second-degree kidnapping, you never showed any emotion. Yeah. And for somebody who believes he is so innocent, why was there no emotion? My attorney, John, John O'Connell in Salt Lake, and I've always mused over just how I should behave. What's the right way for Ted Bunny to behave and make sure that people get the right impression? And I just behave the way I feel is right. Okay, let me take the day of March 1st and so I feel. Uh, I showed no emotion. I felt emotion, believe me. Now, <laughs> the irony comes here. When Carol DeRoche, the kidnapping victim from Utah, came to testify in this preliminary hearing here, I was beside myself with rage. Uh, she is turning into a professional witness as far as I'm concerned. She is a prosecution witness. And when I heard her go through that routine that I had heard three times before, I had restrained myself every time. I couldn't do it this time. And I told my attorney, I said, I'm going to get up. And I got up and I pointed at the judge and I pointed at her and I said, she's lying. She's lied three times before and she's lying now. And I felt it. And he pulled me down and he says, listen, he says, you can't do that. And I said, okay, but I had to do it for once. For once I had to do it. And do you know something? People say, Ted Bundy didn't show any emotion. There must be something in that. I showed emotion. You know what people said? See, you really can get violent and angry. Uh, there's no right, right way for me to act. I act, and I don't care what people think about how I act. I act according to the way I think is right and best for me at the time. And I'm not going to try to please people or impress people because, quite frankly, the amount of bias and, and prejudice that surrounds me as a, as a media image, I can't begin to tear down. Not with this interview or a hundred interviews. Ted, do you believe I'm a person from the media, mm -hmm. other people here, do you believe that we created you, that, 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 it's, that it's our fault, that we created this image of... of the mass murder? Is that, is that what you're saying to us? Um, well, I think in the course of doing your job, you did. Not out of, not in a malign way, not, not, not in a, a personal vendetta against me, but in the course of, of, of publishing the uh, material uh, and broadcasting the material coming out of the Salt Lake County Sheriff's Office or the Salt Lake County Prosecutor's Office, you began to plant the seed in people's minds. Now, that may be your constitutional right and duty, as well as, you know, your livelihood. 
Um, but I think in the process, you did create a, a media image of me uh, that's far beyond, you know, the reality of me. As John O'Connell called the Bundy Monster? That's what he called it. We ought to, so I suggested to John we ought to get Mattel to make little dolls that walk and say, I'm the Bundy Monster. Um, Tell me, ask you this. You totally believe you're innocent. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not questioning that. My question to you is, how did it come to be that Ted Bundy mm -hmm. could be involved in some of these things and has now been charged, convict, convicted once, mm -hmm. is now facing first degree murder charges, mm -hmm. and as you know, is being suspected in, in other murders. How did Ted Bundy come out? Where did he come from? That's a very long story, and I can really can't. If I knew the answers to that question, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. I'd be back in Salt Lake with a new trial, and one day I'll have those new. Uh, one day I'll have those answers, and one day I'll have a new trial. Okay, but I don't know why. Okay, I, I can't begin to understand why. I know that, the, that there's a lot of uh, police ego on the line. I know that a lot of men in the detectives division, in Salt Lake County Sheriff's Office, jobs are on the line. I know that it's, it's a long time ago it ceased to be an issue as to whether or not I was innocent or guilty. The issue is now is can we pin it on him? Can we, can we follow through and, and, and maintain our rep reputation as law enforcement officers? And I'll tell you, as long as they attempt to keep their heads in the sand about me, there's going to be people turning up in canyons and there are going to be people being shot in Salt Lake City because the police there aren't willing to accept what I think they know, and they know that I didn't do these things. Okay. Yeah. okay. ...bludgeoned and pummeled her about the head. She had a ligature around her neck, which was a pantyhose that strangled. As to count two, the indictment, while the victim was in her bed, was stripped of her night clothing, one nipple was incised and bit off. There was evidence of vaginal and anal trauma, and she was left in a pool of blood in her own bed. Ted Bundy was a charmer. He charmed the shoes off of him. He was an enjoyable, likable, attractive person. He was um, thoughtful, charismatic. And overall, he was quite personable. Well, if you can, can you hear that? I can hear it, yeah. Okay. I just wrote, I just said that the Hawkins girl's head was severed. Ted Bundy was born Theodore Robert Bundy on November 24, 1946, in Burlington, Vermont. He started life as his mother's secret shame, as his illegitimate birth humiliated her deeply religious parents. Eleanor Louise Cowell, who went by Louise, was 22 years old when she delivered Ted at a home for unwed mothers. Later, Cowell brought her son to her parents in Philadelphia to hide the fact he was an illegitimate child. Bundy was raised as the adopted son of his grandparents and was told that his mother was his sister. Bundy and his mother moved to Tacoma, Washington. His mother married Johnny Bundy, who formally adopted Ted and gave him his last name. Johnny tried to include his adopted son in camping trips and other family activities, but he remained distant. Ted would later complain to a girlfriend that Johnny was not his real father, wasn't very bright, and didn't make much money. Bundy varied his recollections of Tacoma in later years. He described roaming his neighborhood, picking through trash barrels in search of pictures of naked women. He read detective magazines and crime novels for stories that involved sexual violence, particularly when the stories were illustrated with pictures of dead or maimed women. He once said that he would consume large quantities of alcohol and canvas the community late at night in search of undraped windows where he could observe women undressing or whatever else he could see. He chose to be alone as an adolescent because he was unable to understand interpersonal relationships. He also claimed to have no natural sense of how to develop friendships. I didn't know what made people want to be friends, Bundy said. While a student at the University of Washington, Bundy fell in love with a wealthy, pretty young woman from California named Diane Edwards. She had everything that he wanted, money, class, and influence. He described her as the only woman he ever loved, but she broke up with him. Many of Bundy's later victims resembled his college girlfriend, 
attractive students with long, dark hair. By the mid-1970s, Bundy had transformed himself, becoming more outwardly confident and active in social and political matters. He even got a letter of recommendation from the Republican governor of Washington after working on his campaign. There is no confirmation as to when or where Bundy began killing women. He told different stories to different people and refused to give the specifics of his earliest crimes. Bundy's earliest documented homicides were committed in 1974, when he was 27 years old. By his own admission, he had by then mastered the necessary skills, in the era before DNA profiling, to leave minimal incriminating forensic evidence at crime scenes. In the fall of 1974, Bundy moved to Utah to attend law school, and women began disappearing there as well. The following year, he was pulled over by the police. A search of his vehicle uncovered burglary tools, a crowbar, a face mask, rope, and handcuffs. He was arrested for possession of these tools, and the police began to link him to much more sinister crimes. In 1975, Bundy was arrested for the kidnapping of Carol Duranch, one of the few women to escape his clutches. He was convicted and received a one to 15 year jail sentence. Bundy escaped from prison twice in 1977. The first time, he was indicted on murder charges for the death of a young Colorado woman and decided to act as his own lawyer in the case. During a trip to the courthouse library, he jumped out a window and made his first escape. He was captured eight days later. In December that year, Bundy escaped from custody again. He climbed up a hole he made in the ceiling of his cell, having dropped more than 30 pounds to fit through the small opening. Authorities didn't discover that Bundy was missing for 15 hours, giving the serial killer a big head start on the police. After Bundy's second escape from prison, he eventually made his way to Tallahassee, Florida. On the night of January 14, 1978, Bundy broke into the Chi Omega sorority house at Florida State University. He attacked four young female residents and killed two of them, Margaret Bowman and Lisa Levy. On February 9th, Bundy kidnapped and murdered a 12-year-old girl named Kimberly Leach. These crimes marked the end of his murderous rampage, as he was soon pulled over by the police later that month. The most damning evidence connecting Bundy to the two Chi Omega murders at FSU were bite marks on Levy's body, which were a definitive match to Bundy. I grew up in a wonderful home with two dedicated and loving parents, and one of uh, five brothers and sisters. A home where we as, our, as children were the focus of, of my parents' lives, where we regularly attended church, two Christian parents who did not drink, they did not smoke, there was no gambling, there was no physical abuse or fighting in the home. I'm not saying this was leave it to beaver. It wasn't a perfect home. Well, no, I don't know that such a home exists, but it was a fine, solid Christian home, and nobody... Uh, I hope no one will try to take the easy way out and to try to blame or otherwise accuse my, uh, my family of contributing to this because uh, I know, and I'm trying to tell you as honestly as I know how, what happened, and I think this is a message I'm going to get across. But as a young, uh, a young boy, and I mean a boy of uh, 12 or 13, certainly, uh, that I encountered outside the home again uh, in... Uh, the local grocery store, the local uh, uh, drug store, the softcore pornography, what people call softcore. Uh, but as I think I, I explained to you last night, Dr. Dobson, in an anecdote, uh, that as young boys do, we explored the, the back roads and sideways and byways of our neighborhood, and oftentimes people would dump the garbage and whatever they were cleaning out of their house, and from time to time we'd come across. So, pornographic books of a harder nature than uh, more uh, graphic, you might say, more explicit nature than we would encounter, let's say, in your local grocery store. And this also included such things as, let's say, detective magazines and uh, more hard Those that involve hard violence. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, I, I, and this is something I think I want to emphasize is the, 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 the most damaging uh, kinds of pornography. And my, again, I'm talking from personal experience. Uh, hard, real, personal experience. The most damaging kinds of pornography are those that involve violence uh, and sexual violence.
as the wedding of those two forces, as, as I know only too well, brings about behavior that is just, uh, mm. is just uh, too terrible to describe. Now walk me through that. What was going on in your mind at that time? Okay, before we go any further, I think I mean, it's important to me and, uh, and that, people, that people believe what I'm saying, to, to tell you that, that I'm not blaming pornography and not saying that it caused me to go out and do certain things and I take full responsibility for whatever I've done and all the things that I've done that's not the question here the question and, and, and the issue is how this kind of literature contributed and helped mold and, and shape the kinds of violent behavior it fueled your fantasies it? well in, in the beginning it fuels this kind of thought process then, it, it, at a certain time, it's instrumental in what I would say crystallizing it, making it, make it into something which is almost an, like a separate entity inside. And that in, at that point, you're at the verge, or I was at the verge of acting out on this on this kind of these kinds of things. Now, I really want to understand that you had gone about as far as you could go in your own fantasy life mm -hmm. with printed material, and you made or printed and video or film film, or film magazines yeah. what happened and and then there was the urge to take that little step or big step over to a physical right. uh, event and it happens it, it happened in stages gradually it doesn't necessarily not to me at least happen overnight my experience with I say pornography generally but with pornography that deals on a violent level with the sexuality um, is that once you become addicted to it, and I look at this as a kind of addiction, uh, like other kinds of addiction, of addiction, you keep, I would keep looking for more potent, more explicit, more it's graphic aggressive. kinds of material. Like an addiction, you keep craving something which is harder, harder, will give you that which is beyond just reading about it or looking at it. How long did you stay at that point before you actually assaulted someone? Well, yeah, you see, <coughs> That is a very delicate point in my own development. And we're talking about something, we're talking about having reached the point or a, a, a gray area that surrounded that point over a course of years. You don't remember years. how long that well, was? Well, I, I would say, I would say a couple years. And what was I was dealing with there were very strong inhibitions against criminal behavior, or violent behavior that had been conditioned into me, bred into me in my environment, in my neighborhood, in my church, uh, in my school. Um, things which said, no, this is wrong. I mean, this, I mean, even to think of it is wrong, but it, certainly to do it is wrong. And you're on, well, I'm on that edge in these, the last, the, the, you might say, the last vestiges of restraint. Uh, the barriers to actually doing something were being tested constantly and assault assailed um, through the kind of fantasy life that was fueled largely by pornography. Do you remember what pushed you over that edge? Do you remember well, the decision to go for it? Do you remember where you decided to throw caution to the wind? Again, when you say pushed, I don't. I, I know what you're saying. I don't want to yes. infer again. I, I that, understand that. That, that I was that, 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 that I was some helpless yeah. kind of a victim, and yet uh, we're talking about an influence which, that is, the influence of violent types of media and, and violent pornography, which had an which was an indispensable link in the chain of behavior, the, the chain of events that led to the behaviors, to the, to the assaults, to the murders, and what, and what have you. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very difficult thing to describe. Uh, uh, the, the sensation of, the, the, of, of reaching that point where, you, where I knew It, it was like something had, say, snapped. That I knew that uh, that I couldn't control it anymore. That these barriers that that I had had been uh, I'd learned as a child uh, that had been instilled in me were not enough to hold me back with respect to seeking out and, and harming.
hurting somebody. Would it be accurate to call that a, a, a frenzy, a sexual frenzy? Well, yes, it, that's one way to describe it. A compulsion, a, a, a building up of, of this destructive energy. Uh, again, uh, I, uh, another factor here that I haven't mentioned is the use of alcohol. But I think that what alcohol did, uh, in conjunction with, let's say, my exposure to pornography, was alcohol reduced my inhibitions at the same time. Um, the, the, the fantasy life that was fueled by pornography uh, eroded them further. In the early days, you were nearly always about half drunk when you did these things, is that right? Yes. yes. Uh, was that always true? I, I would say that that was generally the case, yeah. almost with, with, without a All right, if I can understand it now, there's this battle going on within. There are the conventions that you've been taught, there's the right and wrong that you learned as a child, mm -hmm. and then there is this, this uh, unbridled passion uh, fueled by uh, your plunge into hardcore violent pornography, and those things are at war with each other. Yes. And then with the... Uh, alcohol diminishing the, uh, the inhibitions uh, you let go. Well, yes, and to, you can summarize it that way, and that's accurate, certainly. And it, it just occurred to me that some people would, would say that, well, I, I've seen that stuff and it doesn't do anything to me. And I can understand that. I don't, virtually everyone, uh, can be exposed to so-called pornography and while they're aroused to it to one degree or another and not go out and do anything wrong. Well, the addictions are like that. They affect some yeah. people more than they affect others. Well, but there is a percentage of people affected by hardcore pornography in a very violent way and you're obviously one of them. That was a major component and I don't know why I was vulnerable to it. All I know is that, uh, that, it, uh, that it had an, an impact on me uh, that was just so uh, central to the development of the violent behavior that I engaged in. Ted, after you committed your first murder, what was the emotional effect on you? What happened in the days after that? Well, again, this, please understand that even all these years later, it's very difficult to, to talk to about talk. it, and, to, and, and reliving it through talking about it uh, is, is uh, difficult to say the least, but I want you to understand what happened. It was like coming out of some kind of horrible trance or, or dream. Um, I can only liken it to after, you know, I, I don't want to over-dramatize it, but to have been possessed by something so awful and so alien and then the next morning wake up from it remember what happened and realize that basically I mean in the eyes of the law certainly in the eyes of God you're responsible to have to wake up in the morning and and realize what I had done and with a clear mind and all my essential moral and ethical feelings intact at that moment absolutely horrified that I was capable of doing something like that. You really hadn't known that before? Uh, there is just absolutely no way to describe first the brutal urge to do that kind of thing and then what happens is once it it has been more or less satisfied and recede, you might say, or spent that, that sense, that kind of energy level recedes. And basically, I became my, myself again. I, and I want people to understand this too, and I'm not saying this gratuitously because it's important people understand this. That basically, I was a normal person. Uh, I, I wasn't uh, some guy hanging out uh, at bars or a bum or. I wasn't a pervert in the sense that, you know, people look at somebody and say, I know there's something wrong with him and just tell. I mean, I, 
I, I was essentially a normal person. I had good friends. I, I, uh, I led a normal life, except for this one small but very potent and very destructive segment of it that I kept very secret and very close to myself and didn't let, let anybody know about it. And part of the shock and horror for my dear friends and family when, years ago when I was first arrested was that they just, there was no clue. They looked at me and they looked at the, you know, the, um, the all-American boy. And I'm, uh, I mean, I wasn't perfect, but it was, it was it, I yeah, want to be quite candid with you. I was, I was okay, okay, uh, I was. And the basic humanity and, and basic spirit that God gave me was intact, but it unfortunately became overwhelmed at times. And I think people need to recognize that it's not some kind of... The, 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 those of us who, are, who have been so much influenced by violence in the media, in particular pornographic violence, are not some kinds of inherent monsters. We are your sons and we are your husbands. And we grew up in regular families. And pornography can reach out and snatch a kid out of any house today. He, he snatched me out of my home, it snatched me out of my home 20, 30 years ago. And as diligent as my parents were, and they were diligent in protecting their children. And as good a Christian home as we had, and we had a wonderful Christian home, uh, there is no protection against the, kind, that, the kinds of influences that are loose in the society that, that, that tolerates. Ted, outside these walls right now, there are several hundred reporters that wanted to talk to you. Yeah. And you asked me to come here from California because you had something you wanted to say. This hour that we have together uh, is not just an interview with a man who's scheduled to die tomorrow morning. Listen, I'm no social scientist and I haven't done a survey. I mean, I, I don't pretend that I know what John Q. Citizen thinks about this. <clears throat> but I've lived in prison for a long time now. And I've met a lot of men who were motivated to commit violence just like me. And without exception, every one of them was deeply involved in pornography without question, without exception, deeply influenced and consumed by an addiction to pornography. There's no question about it. The FBI's own study on serial homicide shows that the most common interest among serial killers is pornography. Yeah, that's true. And it's and it's real. It's true. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, it does. Uh, one of the, the final uh, murders that you committed, of course, uh, was apparently little Kimberly Leach, 12 years of age. Uh, I think the, the public outcry is greater there because an innocent child was taken from a, from a playground. What did you feel after that? What was there? Were there the normal emotions three days later? Where were you, Ted? I... I can't really talk about that right now. That's... That's too painful. I would like to... Uh, I'd like to be able to convey to you what that... that... Uh, that experience is like, but I can't, that I won't okay. be able to talk about that. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let me start with one. Let me start this way. Um, the unidentified remains. Uh, um, this is where I'm a little bit, uh, the, the presence of the officers down here is a little bit unnerving. Uh, some of it, some of the stuff I don't mind talking about, but because they wouldn't know from Adam. But I, but names, I will, I can write it down, or I can whisper it to you, or whatever. I just don't want the police getting any kind of names at this point. Yeah. Well, if you can, can you hear that? I can hear it. Yes. Okay. I just wrote. I just said that the Hawkins girl's head was severed. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, but I, not anything you would have found that I know of. If you'd uh, you would have found it, probably you would have found a, a damage to the head, the jaw in particular, probably broken. But if you'd found that, you would have known who it was. But anyway, I don't know. Is there any reason you ask me that question? Uh, I was moving up the alley. Uh, using a, uh, a briefcase and some crutches. And a young woman walked down. I saw, saw her round the, the north end of the block into the alley and stop for a moment and then keep on walking down the alley toward me. And about halfway down the block, I encountered her and asked her to help me carry the briefcase, which she did, and we walked back up the alley. Across the street, turned right on the sidewalk in front of, I think, the well, a fraternity house on the corner there. Uh, round at the corner to the left, going north on 47th. Well, uh, I basically when I reached the car, what happened was I knocked her, knocked her unconscious with the crowbar. Where did you have that? By the car. Outside and back of the car. Did she see it? No. Okay. No. And then uh, there was some there were some handcuffs there, along with the crowbar. Along with what? The crowbar. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, they handcuffed her and put her in the drivers, I mean the passenger side of the car and drove away. Was she alive or dead? Oh no, no, she was quite, con not uh, she was unconscious, but she was very much alive. One of the things that makes it a little bit, well, among the things that makes it difficult is that uh, at this point she was quite lucid talking about things about some, <laughs> it's, it's funny, it's, it's fun, not funny, but it's odd the kinds of th things people say in, under those circumstances. And she thought, she said that she thought that she had a Spanish test the next day, and she thought that I had taken her to help tutor me for a Spanish test. Well, I'm going to maybe try to make this uh, get there by degrees. The long and short of it was that that I again knocked her unconscious and strangled her and drug her into uh, about ten yards into the small grove of trees that was there. What are you strangling with? Cord. Cord? An old an old piece of an old piece of rope. Yeah. yeah, something that's in the car. Mm -hmm. Okay, then what happened? Then I uh, packed the car up. By this time, it was almost dawn. It was just about dawn. Mm -hmm. Sun was coming up. Mm -hmm. And I went through my usual, I say usual routine. I went through this routine where I was just absolutely, I would go through this, but on this particular morning, I, I was just absolutely, again, just shocked, kind of scared to death, shocked, horrified. About, and I went down the road throwing everything that I'd had, the briefcase out the window, throwing the briefcase, the, 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 the crutches, the rope, the clothes, just tossing them out the window. This was just, I was in a, a sheer state of panic, of just absolute horror, you know. Uh, it's like at that point in time, this consciousness of what has really happened is like you break out of a fever or something. I would. That is